All right, uh, we're live. Um, hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to the second episode uh, of the People Story uh, by X2Tenx. I am Parth, and I lead the Tenx People product here. Uh, today, we have joining us three very special guests, uh, Naveen, Vijay, and Abhishek, uh, in conversation with Psyche to discuss what it takes uh, to build a great culture. The idea this time is to go a little deeper on this uh, from just being an abstract topic uh, to make it more real with some stories and insights from the individual journeys at, at Inmobi and MyGate. Uh, starting with something that I have personally experienced while working as a people manager uh, at Schlumberger, Grofers, Uber, and now at x is firstly, how do I ensure uh, that understanding of culture is same throughout the org? Uh, and even the last person on ground sort of understands and feels excited about it. Uh, and secondly, how does one ensure that team members sort of imbibe the culture of the company, uh, but at the same time, maintain their individuality uh, and personal style of working? Is there a balance to be maintained between the two? And if yes, sort of how do we achieve that? I would love to learn more about these and a lot more today. Uh, I request the audience to sort of please uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we will try and cover them towards the end. Uh, and with that, I now hand it over to Psyche uh, for taking the discussion forward. Thanks so much. Thank you, Parth. Thanks for the, uh, for the questions that are on your mind. Uh, look forward to the conversation. Naveen Abhishek, Vijay, warm welcome. Um, so so um, here's, where we'll, here's where we'll start, guys. Um, obviously, we are going to get today the idea is to get very deep into, into the reality of what this topic means to you and what you actually do, uh, both personally as founders, as well as, um, as well as how you manage to, your companies are at scale, you have thousands of of team members, how have you made it real for everyone in the company and what is, what's the stuff you do and what's the stuff you don't do. So we, we're going to get there in a little while uh, into a fairly meaningful level of depth. But I want to start with a slightly more philosophical question, which is for you to talk about why this topic even matters to you. Is it even on your radar? And honest answers, huh, guys, uh, please. Is it even on your radar? Was this always on your mind when you started the company that boss, when I build a company, I'm going to, it's really going to stand for great culture. When did it become real for you and why? What made this topic important to you? We'll start with you, Naveen. Hey, first of all, thank you, Saiki, for, uh, for inviting. Uh, always great to uh, you know, come and share thoughts with you. I'll say the following. I think, uh, you know, truth be told, I don't think, uh, you know, pieces around culture, uh, you know, people practices, etc. were at least top of the mind when, when I started in Mobi. And the reason for that was it's not, you know, it's, it's always said, you know, it's important, but, but when you talk to people on the ground, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, you never get to hear it. Uh, you you talk to your investors, they never talk to you about it, right? So my investors never talked about it. My uh, In my board meetings, it never happened, especially in the early days, like nobody cared. Uh, and so I didn't think it was important. I didn't think it was important uh, till, uh, till you experience things yourself where it becomes very hard to, uh, you know, understand wh why should something, why should something be happening? And for us, that moment was sometime in 2013 almost close to about four to five years later than, you know, post, you know, starting the company. And it was a moment when we were actually on a high when huh. it comes to the success that media was putting against us. Right. So, so, you know, it was a, it was one of those period, time periods when media was putting you on a high and you had people who were walking out the door every few minutes. Uh, and and in that year of 2013, which was one of the most phenomenal financially, one of the most phenomenal growth years we had, we lost, we added 800 people in the organization, and we probably had like 40 percent churn, something like that, right? some obscene wow. number. Wow! Because people would come in and they would leave, and uh, and and the ones that had, that we had prior to that were also leaving because they were totally disconnected to say we brought the company to this level. I don't hmm. think this this thing makes any more sense. I think we're going to go. And I think it was that moment. It was it's not the it's not the best way to learn about things because you're making a mistake to learn it. And I think part of all, all of this conversation probably is to try and get people to understand that this is this is not uh, uh, no. this is this, like this should not be learned but the hard way the way at least we you know we had to do. But I think even then, 
the reality is even today that that is not the conversation right it's not a celebrated point it's not a point of saying hey let's build build a great culture that's you know that's like oh, oh it's nice to have a great culture um, it seems uh, you know fine to do it and i think uh, the board the, the the board conversations are not that the investor conversations are not that the uh, the conversations uh, in the media are not that so you know as an as an entrepreneur who is young and who is trying to figure out a company this seems like a nice to have and the problem in entrepreneurship or you know, when you're running a company or anything you either do things which are really important or you don't do them right or you just do like you know enough to just not screw them up now things which are really important you will you will for sure do for example fundraising it's really important you will do whatever is needed to get the fundraising in place you know to to do sales you will do whatever is needed to get the sales in place right so there are things which are like you know you will do anything to and this and this doesn't fall in that bucket today. Uh-huh. and the and the, and the key question frankly with you know you are somewhere asking in that question is uh, is hey is this that important or is it that not that important given the fact that i've come to speak on the topic of course you know where i stand on this topic yes. uh, but but and i've seen the results of it and i've seen massive significant results of uh, you know of uh, uh, of building a great culture uh, oh. you know not just to come out of the situation that we were in back then but also you know building you know things to a very different level of heights uh, you know because of the culture and i've also seen company that you know i've been around for 10 12 years now as an entrepreneur so i i think i know most companies uh and i've seen you know some very very good well capitalized companies absolutely get into like a trash spot right now because they just couldn't get this piece right they had all the capital in the world they still have all the capital in the world but they're just burning through capital and they're not able to utilize it so mm. the correlation between success and capital is increasingly becoming less and less so success bit uh, you know correlation between you know a great team culture etc etc and decent resources is very high right so anyway so for you there. really navin the wake up call was uh, somewhere 4 5 years into your journey you were actually on a financial high and you had 30 40% of people including some people who started with you uh, who had the mission sort of belief with you actually starting to leave the company because they felt so and that was a deep enough wake up call for you saying hang on what's going on i need to do something that was the wake up call for you no 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 it's it, it, so it's a series of things that happened there right so i saw people leave and as a while you leaving can't you see the newspaper headlines we're on <laughs> um and the reality is by the way the success of the failure of the company is measured by the forward looking you know indication of that is the good people leaving your organization right? it's a very simple right. measure right so if you want to figure out like how well the company is doing don't look at the financials they only tell you what's in the rear view mirror uh, but you look into you know how some of the best people in the company are perform- where they are so if you see uh-huh. companies where the good people are leaving that's great you you know what the company is all about right so you can uh-huh. in short the companies immediately or you can long the company immediately got it uh, got now it. in that argument we were seeing great people leave very very good people left us right and i'm still in touch with them and i keep apologizing to them on why <laughs> I, and how badly i screwed up at that point of time had they stayed they would have had a better chance we would have done even better but and i couldn't fix it because i tried to simply go back and tell you know you know put this process put that process you know it was all about processes it was not about you know anything else and i don't think culture is about processes it's about something far more deeper innate and you know you talked about the, asked the question and saying hey how does how do you ensure that everyone like everyone is aware of the culture well if it's the right one people will be aware of it you actually don't have to do all the hard work to try and tell them that look we have a great culture like the yeah. this whole need for communicating the culture is actually like it's not needed you only have to do it when you're when you're we're, we're, we're going to we're going to come back to that point navin it's interesting you say that and i'll make two comments about that and i'm going to come to you in a minute vijay and abhishek i know you have a fascinating story to tell as well um, on on this dimension but two comments here on people will know it uh, by the way across our work as extra10x as we have looked at about 20000 people who work in the startup ecosystem the one thing on which all startups tend to rank pretty highly is people who identify with the sense of mission mission feel very attached to the company people who don't have an employee nps of minus 87 
minus 87. And the startups that are in the bottom quartile of employee NPS, the issue that hurts them the most is up to 30 to 40%. It's an uncanny coincidence, I mean, with your number. You said you were losing 30, 40% people in that year in 2013. 30 to 40% of the people in those companies who are in the bottom quartile are actually thinking about leaving the company. So what you're saying was clearly very real in your context and also true at the ecosystem level, that if I don't feel that sense of uh, identifying with what this company is up to. I don't want to be a part of this. And without that in the startup ecosystem, you're lost because pretty much every company does a pretty decent job of this. On that note, Vijay, Abhishek, I want to ask you the same question, which is what made this piece real for you? Uh, first you, uh, Vijay, and then, and then your comments, Abhishek, on why did this topic even register on your radar? Yeah, I think, uh... You know, at uh, my gate, right? Initially, say again, uh, did we think about culture from day one? Uh, may not be from day one, but very early in our stage, right? We thought that you know we need to have strong uh, values and cultures within the company, right? And we did list our uh, values and uh, cultures what we need to have for ourselves, right? But uh, you know, uh, were we doing something to measure how we are? panning out with respect to the values and cultures that we have set up for ourselves. I think we didn't do much with respect to that, right? But uh, the shit hit the roof when, you know, we were, we started growing from say, you know, 100 people to 600 people in one year, right? And that is the time we did realize that, you know, the fabric that we want to set everybody into, right? And that was getting diluted, right? Our thought process like our innovation, like customer service, how do you represent yourself in front of the customer? What are the ethics and what are the things that we, uh, you know, boast ourselves about, right? All, some of those things are getting uh, diluted. I would, I would not say diluted, but, you know, the last person was not knowing what this is, right? Hmm. That was a bigger concern for us, right? And then and we how, started- How did you even know this, Vijay? So uh, you said 100 to 600 people, which is obviously very fast growth, but how did you even- know that this is what is happening, that people uh, don't understand what we're about? How did you even come to know? So when we like, you know, uh, like me and Abhishek keep visiting all the cities, right, where our teams uh -huh. are good. When we speak to them, we get to know, right? When you're talking to them, when they're, you know, when they are representing problems or when they're saying that, you know, this is what we do with the clients, it comes out, right? It's like, you know, it's not saying that, you know, we are not agreeing to this culture, but it comes out that, you know, they are not in sync with what we actually, what we actually oh. think, right? Oh. Oh. So the replications are actually very bad, right? What happens at a city level is, you know, we'll have like say customer service is a, you know, is a practice. It's a, it's a, it has to be within your DNA, right? Oh. Otherwise what will happen is people will feel that this is a job. The moment it is a job, you need to have, you know, checklists, you need to have end of day reports and you need to have, you know, lots of tools to make sure that they're doing the job what they're supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. When we started seeing that, okay, people started asking tools, I want a reminder for this, I wanted mm -hmm. a, you know, uh, end of day report and all those things, right? These are the subtle indicators you get that, you know, things are not happening the way you, you desire, right? Mm -hmm. That's the time we realized that, okay, we need to do something more in terms of making sure that the last man in the organization is also thinking like Abhishek, me and Shreyas, right? Or, you know, the Bangalore office, right? And that's the time it got us to thinking that we need to do more and more in terms of, you know, how do people get to know about the culture and values of the company? But I'm Abhishek, so, if, I, if, I, if I can push both of you on that, Abhishek, your comments as well. I mean, it's okay. I mean, it's fine. People want reminders. They want to be told you have to do check check-ins. You have to do reviews. Why is that? Why is that a wake-up call? I mean, why does that worry you so much? And why did you then start going to this big topic of culture and say, hey, we really need to do something? Is that, was that enough to build that conviction? So I'll add to it, uh, Saiki, and thanks first for inviting us. Uh, I, I feel so. at least the three of us as founder had the advantage of you know, 17, 16 years of work experience across different uh, corporates uh, before we jumped into entrepreneurship. And, and specifically for me, uh, prior to my gate, my transition on focus and culture really happened. When you first study it in or, or, you know, classes like org behavior, you think of that as a soft, nice to have topic and people don't pay attention because mm -hmm. everybody's thinking about hardcore subjects like finance and marketing and, and strategy, obviously, as a buzzword. Mm -hmm. 
and and then you uh, i and 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 vijay happened to be part of uh, goldman sachs and i personally really got positively impacted by seeing uh, an organization which is such a strong culture to give an example you know yes it is a 100 years old company offices across the world but no matter who do you interact with there is a very common fabric of how they operate right yeah. how, the 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 language and phrases may be different but the behaviors uh, demonstrated at work nobody is telling anybody to to operate or behave in a certain way but you uh-huh. visit the multiple office you will find an underlying fabric of how people behave how people respond to clients how people look about financial risk and that really had a lasting impact uh, on me where i saw a very strong culture vis-a-vis one of my previous company where you know whether we like it or not culture will be formed now you can deliberately shape it or it will be shaped in a ugly uh, disfigured form where there will be subculture driven by geography department or individuals Mm-hmm. now that is a position you don't want to be so for me when coming into uh, and, and being part of the migate journey as co-founder first thing was i think three of us as founder aligned very strongly on some core values and then we started to demonstrate it more to our first head of sales or first tech uh, you know leader or the first uh, you know operations lead i i think just being part of it and they they working with us closely it slowly happened but really the 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 ramific or the reality hit is when i think we grew really fast in the last two years and we realized what we you know it has to be now a deliberate attempt uh, so i i would say that you know we were very conscious of it but putting a deliberate attempt happened in the last one and a half years got it so it's a nice um, thing i picked up from both your comments which is rather than slip into a checklist mode of working which is everyone has to be managed and told what to do day in and day out you would much rather have every team member taking initiative and owning the company much like you do and for you the difference between the two is culture or at least that's the way you have seen it at migate as a as a very simple example in migate the word employee is banned hmm right nobody has to nobody can use the word employee hmm right even if i interacting with x to 10x team and if part or somebody uses the word employee i say you cannot use it in the context of my kid <laughs> understood so these are these small small things and and paying attention to these small details adds up got it thanks uh, thanks abhishek coming back to you navin so understood the trigger which is and sounds like both at inmobi and at migate it's after you tasted success and in initial scale that suddenly it got very real saying hang on the company can't continue like this uh, any more talk us through a little bit navin of what the journey looked like for you um what did you do when this hit you and you said hang on 30% of the good people are leaving i need to do something what did you actually do you know um i didn't have the experience let's say that vijay and abhishek had right so i you know this was for all practical reasons my second job i only worked as a uh, with you you know so i kept worked uh, in the, for the first three years only so i only had three years right. so years. you're kind of implying that working with me was no preparation for culture uh, <laughs> <laughs> navin mean, it's okay we we'll deal with that offline yeah 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 and that's why you, you know, that's why we should chat about those pieces also at some point <laughs> but, yeah. so we all the uh, unresolved issues navin yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so for me it was not the you know it was uh, it was an issue with i thought it was an issue with me hmm. right i didn't think the issue was with the approach to building culture right hmm. I, or approach okay. to doing i didn't even understood the word culture and approach to dealing with people right i thought the i just didn't understand this i was the new ceo you know getting all all sorts of you know accolades from different places but you know how do i know how to scale right because this whole issue that we just referred to we grew from 200 to 800 people right added 600 people in a in a year uh but lost few hundred by the end of the year <laughs> so hmm. it, was, it was crazy like you were hiring and you were leaving getting people were leaving uh and so i first my first attempt was to essentially go and look at the the blue book whatever that may be right like there must hmm. be a template to solve <laughs> for this problem. so i went up to the template and i i remember 
calling up all the friends that I know in, you know, either consulting or in other places to say, send it to me, send it to me. <laughs> and give me and, the answer. <laughs> yeah, give me the answer, right? Because it, it, it's a known problem. Like, why should I be the first one trying to solve for it? Or why should I apply first principle to, to solving for this problem? And, and I applied all of that. I hired like, you know, some very, very good people who had done this, you know, at places where things like these scale and I said, you know, just make it happen. Wow. But, but the bigger issue, and you know, we can get into the details of it, but the bigger issue is that it is not a process problem. It's not a process problem. The process is only, people are there. You have to essentially, you know, the crux of this is that I think we start to treat people as commodity as the minute you start to put process around it. But the reality is in a, in a world of startup, every individual counts and they can add, you know, X to 10X value, right? Oh. Every individual can add them. Now, we, in the way the processes are built, if you lead with the process, you're just going to screw it up so badly that it's just oh. going to accelerate the problem, not actually stop the problem. But oh. you would spend more money, more effort, more communication, like you do everything a lot more. Huh. And, but in reality, culture is a lot more like, you know, who do you want to be? Huh. How do you want to live every day? It's actually a very simple question with actually very simple answers. It actually is not a complex process answers. If you can answer that simple question on what do you want the company to be? What do you want the people to be? And you ask them, the ones that are, you know, that are very active about these things to say, what do you want it? What do you want it to be here? Huh. You will get a very simple set of answers, and I think Abhishek was just mentioning that. You know, he was mentioning, "Don't use the word employee." Actually, mm -hmm. what one should emphasize on the on that thing is to say, it's a very small thing that he did, that he talked about. Mm -hmm. But when it when it comes to culture, the small things matter. Mm -hmm. The big ones you will anyway do, like paying people the right amount. Everybody does it, so you will. Mm -hmm. Like giving them, you know, free lunch. Everybody does it, so will you. It's the small things that matter. It's the things about, you know, if it, if people care for, if people, if people want, you know, care in the organization, are you truly giving the care or not? Right? No. True care. It's not, no. it's not fake care. It's not fake care. No. Um, no. It's not to say, look, yeah, uh, you know, yes, you can tell us and we have a process to essentially get you, um, you know, if you are in trouble, we have a loan policy and that loan policy yeah, can yeah. come to you. Everybody has, everybody can do that. It's, it's the fact that, you know, people, all of us as humans need to know that we are cared for. Oh. And it's, it's hardly ever utilized. Like we, we buy, all of us buy insurance, thank God we don't use it all the time. Uh -huh. But it's the, it's that, you know, it's, it's against that fundamental fear. So here, Similarly, here Naveen, take us a bit into the kitchen, uh, Naveen, because I know at that point, you took this very personally, right? And you said, this is not something I'm going to delegate. This is not something I'm going to ask someone else to do. You took on the, if I remember correctly, the HR leadership role yourself. Take us a little bit into the kitchen of what was going on. What did you do? And you also, you made some interesting decisions on what you would not do. So it'd be interesting if you could take us look, into I, the kitchen. Yeah. Look, I think what happened is we, we went through this exercise of, you know, exodus, People not yes. connecting. Like I'll tell you one thing. Twenty, like one of these years, I don't know, 2013, 2014, I was like, okay, I've added 4x the number of people. Let's an, account for some inefficiency. I'll grow 3x. Well, mm -hmm. voila, I grew 30 percent. Not mm -hmm. 3x, 30 percent. Didn't mm -hmm. add up. Like why would I just grow 30 percent? I thought I'll ship more products. Nothing was shipping. And so, and you then put all more of these processes, and then people are you know, more disconnected. And so the more you talk to your people, and I also, by the way, realized that I'd stopped talking to, I thought I was talking to people, but there were so many new people that had come in that my mode of communication had to change. I was uh. still talking to the same people as if it's a 200 people company, not a thousand people company, right? So your mode uh. of communication had to change. And when you, when you ask those questions, you realize that, frankly, everyone is doing their job. Uh. Everyone was doing what they thought was the right thing but there was no umbrella at which this thing was getting connected with. Like people had to feel connected and the lack of that connection is not a responsibility of anybody else. It's your responsibility. Like if people say, if someone stands up today and say, lack of fundraise, is that a CFO problem or is that a, is that a founder or a CEO problem? Hmm. I think the answer is an obvious one, right? With everyone, right. nobody, no CFO ever yet seen get fired or get reprimanded for not raising, not raising funds. Hmm. So why is this suddenly an HR problem? 
Like, why should I blame? Like, even blaming an HR is an incorrect statement. It is your bloody problem. You've not even identified who the organization is. You've asked me to come in and said, go solve it. I, I don't know what to solve. So therefore, you know, and I, this is it. This, this took me about three to six months to understand. Like, you know, unlike Abhishek and Vijay, who actually understood this problem a little better because they came from backgrounds where they'd seen it in effect and were more senior. I, I was just, you know, I was just in a very different state. So for me, it was to say, okay, what are people looking for? So I had to start talking to people. What are people, like what people want? And as I went through that exercise, I realized, very simply put, I realized that if I like an environment that I want to work in, generally speaking, most of the others will also like it. So I am not on the other side of this other side of the rope here. I have to go on that side and then say, what is it that I like to do? If I were there, that's what everybody would generally speaking would like to do. So for example, I like to feel cared and respected. I like to feel trusted. You know, I, I just want and I like to know. And I have, want to have a say in where we are going. Like that's yeah. actually as simple as that. But yeah. that that to me to be able to get there required to talk to people, get them. Now then I went back to the to the to the HR teams at that time and said, look, I I want this done. Well, they have never gone through this exercise because most others will have come from in a system which is already running, right? And these things are already predefined. You're, you have to define your parameters that are important to you. So therefore, to say, uh, uh, to say, you know, I'll care for people, or to say, I'll, you know, I, I want to create an environment of trust. What does that mean? Like, okay, it means that uh, I will give freedom to people. It means that what does freedom mean? Like, you have to ask the fundamental: what does freedom mean? Freedom means they can do what they really want to do, but that does not mean that you know they don't have responsibility. Because actually, by the way, the, the best part is systems and processes are not really screwed up by people, by 100% of people. They're only screwed up by 1% of people. But all our processes are created to solve for that 1%, 1% of the people who screwed it up. So there's this whole, we came up with this philosophy of saying 99% versus 1%. To huh. say, we end up screwing up the 99% because of the 1% people who break the rules. Huh. So let's disaggregate that and let's go after the 1%. And so we created simple rules like, you know, whether it's hot. Now it's very easy to say it, but you know, you want a holiday, go take it. You want to work on a different team, please go just tell us that we'll let you in a different team. Because if you don't let you work in a different team, you leave. Uh, so why uh, not? Like, let's create a you know, free flowing environment. Uh, you know, we talked about, uh, uh, we talked about care, which meant that, you know, if, if uh, we should not just care for you, but we also should care for your family. But that uh, meant something. We have to do something for it. Like, so if you say something, we have got to do something for it. And I think yeah. we started to define all of those rules in some shapes and forms. What we got didn't it. do, what we yeah. didn't do was to say, we will lead with the process. Yeah. We essentially started to get rid of process. So in our company, the, the bad word was process. Because the minute you start to put process to something and then think that that will solve for it, processes scale things. Process doesn't solve the fundamental problem to begin with. So we said, if, if you, anyone comes up with me to say, you know, I have a process for this and you have to follow a process, that in itself means that you don't trust somebody. Hmm. And so we were very, very, you know, diligent about these things uh, in the beginning. Uh, we, 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 we hopefully solved for that. We, we, we were diligent about communicating what we were thinking also very openly. Hmm. And then since then, I've not had to do too much on it, by the way. It's because it, it. it stays. Fascinating. So for you, it started with, hey, I'm not even listening. We've gone to a thousand person company. I don't even know what's going on anymore. So you had a bunch of conversations that actually got you in touch with. It started by saying, I actually didn't even know that I have to listen. It is only when you, when you hear something, then you realize that you also have to listen or, oh, and that your voice is not reaching everybody. Like it's, it's, it's a lot of that. Like, you know, you think that communication percolates like this. It doesn't actually percolate. It just happens. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you have to just do it. And by the way, as Abhishek, I think was saying, either there is a culture, or there is not a culture or it'll take its own shape. It's an amoeba, right? It'll take its own yeah. shape. If there is a culture in your organization. Anyway. I think even before that, I think there was, a, what is interesting about what you said, Naveen, is you said, just like fundraising, this is not a topic that is a functional responsibility. You've got to take it personally. I think that's kind of, that's where it was born. Then, Lots of conversations to say what's really going on. Lots of communication. 
and then some principles that you said let's make it very simple which is this is what people care about this is what i would care about and then finally from those principles like caring the practices making it real like no leave policy if you want to work in a different team by all means go work in a different team because otherwise you're going to leave me so i think the mistake we all sometimes make is you start at the practices end of the you start at the destination of saying now here are all the practices i should implement without necessarily having gone through that journey of discovering what's really deeply relevant to uh, to the teams in your company right I also so also realize one more thing i'll just add to that yeah which was that we also had this urge to copy hmm so hmm. What, what is what is this organization do what does mckinsey do let me just go copy that let me go ask, what does ge do they seem to have something very nice hmm. frankly the crux of this boils down to that one thing that you think that you'll do really well should hmm. just be yours just double down yeah. yeah you just double down on that and if you try the more you try to copy you'll yeah. be nothing like you'll be like you'll not be known for you know for anything of of that sort got it um vijay your comments on how did you start on the journey you said okay this is important now what did you do so i think uh, for us right uh, like some of the core values that we have for ourselves right like you know basically think at scale whenever you're doing something think at scale right the reason is uh, you know whatever whether it's a people practice or whether it is a tech uh, product or whether it is something that you're building for the team right we need to think that you know this thing will operate at scale so so the mindset of innovation and uh, you know solutions at scale has been a very important thing for the company right second is you know we uh, strongly believe that customer service right and this is very innate to us me abhishek shreyans right if any customer gives a call actually the entire organization shakes right so we want to make sure that customers voice is always on the top and their interests are always served right and to make that happen right like you know uh, some of the things that uh, will surprise you is we got close to 8000 communities that you know use my game right yes me and abhishek probably will be in you know 4000 each right or you know there will be some overlaps so we monitor all this like the intent of all these things is to demonstrate that we are all you know uh, always 24 by 7 available for any kind of customer query right so once the founders are doing obviously rest of the team members will also do it right so that's the kind of urgency right whenever something happens the urgency is demonstrated right from the top right uh-huh. so i think whatever we wanted people to practice right it has to be demonstrated from the top if it is not demonstrated then you know it will be like a pipe dream and you know asking people to do something which is not very innate to them right mm-hmm. thinking innovatively right like we say that you know if an uh, if, you know you're on uh, hr team right when you are who is your client all the other team members are your clients whom you are making sure that their voices are heard you know their salaries are processed on time there is some issue with respect to you know some leaves and all those things how they need to be solved is in the similar gravity right the way we solve an external customers problem mm-hmm. our hr team also should solve other team members problems in the similar manner right so that becomes like if a product like say the sales team has got some issue with the product they go to the product team and the product team is also thinking like i should solve the sales team's problems immediately right so mm-hmm. all those things actually come by you know immediately practicing or immediately demonstrating a lot of stuff that we wanted people to do right for us the uh, so part you know, of this is if i understand you which a part of this is you took the onus of leadership by example on your own back saying if this is something i'm going to ask the company to do i'm going to lead by example so i'm going to listen to customers so you're part of 4000 groups it is, it is not with the fact that lead by example that was automatic okay. it was automatic you know yeah, all the process right? it was instinctive so, yeah it was instinctive yeah yes got it abhishek yeah i think you know when when a new individual walks into the company spends let's say the first week on the floor interacting with their team members if you have a strong culture the behaviors of what your team members do is really what will be become part of the new joiners culture or what the values in the culture so in that sense with that approach in mind i, I think it was important for both of us and, and you know from a sales and operations perspective and for shyans from a tech perspective 
is to really i just echo do what you would like the others to do so simple examples like if uh, attention to detail and excellence of what you do is important in the first two years uh, you know vijay and i were in the copy of every email that would go out from our organization to any client hmm. and and we would pound point out commas and paragraph hmm. not being in line or fonts not being in same in, in, you know or or a wrong email being copied and that we did so painfully that at some point uh, we had we, we actually were comfortable stopping because the first set of people realized that this is important and that that automatically became a norm in the organization that the quality of everything that you do is important even if it is an email with three lines on it sent to a customer right mm. if you said that guard is a stakeholder then vijay and i had you know worked as a guard for a month to understand the psyche of a guard so a new leader coming into organization has to at least spend a few days at at the gate of a society to understand the psyche of the guard right mm. uh, so i think that's how we look at it and that's how we got started i'll just end by saying that you know a small change for a large set of people is lot more difficult than a big change for a small set of people right mm. so so you have to really look at from the very beginning and then realize that as the organization grows multi functional multi geography you know bringing any behavior change becomes extremely difficult so mm. your core set of people uh, who have who understands really become the ambassadors for and, and and some of these practices uh, vijay abhishek to go back to the point navin was also making earlier you want to try and stay away from the checklist process mode of everything right where you give everyone a list of things they have to do no matter what which is go spend time as a guard or you know uh, respond to a customer within 15 minutes how have you in your context how have you struck the balance of having a certain like sop driven way of doing things versus having people just understand that that's how we do things at my gate and i'd love to do things that way as well so have you found that that you've had to strike that balance as well yeah i'll give you one approach that i have taken so every person who if i have either interviewed or you know let's say the first week of uh, you know founder session uh, you know if if i do or any one of us does so i have a what's in it for you like a list right why you know you should be with my gate right as part of interview or after they have joined one yeah. of them says we you know you are a customer centric organization if you ever find yourself escalating a customer issue and mm. and it is gone all the way up in the channel and nobody has reacted or done anything about it update your linkedin and cv and leave because that company will not be there right mm. uh, so i think these are some and the other thing i believe uh, or we strongly believe is uh, you know you tell me i'll forget you show me i'll remember you involve me and may you know tell me or work with me to get it done i'll, I'll you know i learn Hmm. so i think that's the approach we have taken mostly uh, you know a lot of our, our organization is very young a lot of uh, 20 and between 20 and 30 group a lot of hmm. freshers are there and i think uh, we owe it to them to help them through in this journey of understanding my gate culture hmm got it and and vijay you gave this example of being part of 4000 groups i'm sure you're not reacting to 4000 customers posting on those groups so obviously part of it is the role modeling and being very sensitive to customers but how has that helped you has it has that helped do you feel now it's you're needing it less because you just did it once upon a time or how do practices like yeah, like that i think uh, from the initial days my involvement has you know reduced you know, drastically right and see uh, yes i keep seeing the conversations on the on the groups but i don't respond but even by seeing the conversations you get a lot of inputs right where you know you, you get a lot of homework for me and abhishek in terms of what do we need to do things differently right suppose a client is not being answered properly it is not the you know person who is dealing with the client it's probably we have not exposed them to the right stuff right so i think these are the kind of inputs we get right now i'm the uh, whatsapp groups are more used for you know getting the right kind of inputs in terms of how do we equip our team members to deal with you know difficult situations yeah? mm. but otherwise i think uh, responses have you know probably i may do you know once in you know week time kind of thing got it so and I, one thing that's striking me about what both of you are saying is again you've kept it very simple very very simple it's not like some fancy thing you've put on the walls it's simple things like how you're responding to customers 
It's simple things like how you're writing emails. It's even using terms like employee versus not use. You've sort of kept it very simple in terms of what you really want to communicate. And that's the, that's the sort of way you've gone about building your elements of culture at my game. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. And, and Vijay, you talk a lot about the concept of, of course, as a former helicopter pilot, you use this very interesting term called airmanship. Yeah. Which is the situational awareness. And you, again, you talked about it in the WhatsApp group. You see what's going on and you're listening. And Naveen also talked about this. Your ears are always open. Can you share a little bit about what does that airmanship mean in a company context and listening? And what are some of the things you have seen that you have then eventually gone and reacted to? See, it's like, uh, you know, uh, some of the times, right, you're sitting in the leadership meeting, right? Each team or each department is asking for the other department in terms of, I need this help from you, right? And, you know, that is the time you observe things, right? From, you know, what is happening, right? If somebody's tone of asking for a help is different and somebody's tone for reciprocating, reciprocating for a help is different, then you get to know that where there is an imbalance, right? Uh -huh. And that is the time you have to double click on that particular areas and talk to them one-on-ones and figure out what's happening, right? Uh -huh. And you will really feel like it almost comes out that, okay, you know, I had an offline conversation with that person and, you know, it didn't help me out, right? And that's the reason I had to be that. Way, right? So I think all those uh, keeping your ears and, uh, you know, uh, see, uh, you have really senior people in the company who are sitting and taking up leadership roles, right? Each one of them know how to deliver their own, you know, job, right? The problem comes when it is interfunctional or interdepartmental, you know, work that needs to be done. And that's the time you can actually smell things if things are not going in the right direction, right? Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I think those are the sound bites that I get while sitting in these rooms or when I go to, you know, different, different cities to interact with the team members, have one-on-ones with them or, you know, speak to them in, in a, you know, in a town hall kind of setup. You just, the kind of questions that you get from people also will give you a lot of sound bites in terms of what's going on, right? And what's probably requires your attention or what requires, you know, the leadership's attention, right? So I think uh, to pinpoint and give an example, right, I, you know, it'd be difficult, but, you know, overall, this is the way we figure out that, you know, things are good or bad, right? Got it, got it. So just the situational awareness, which is, and basically you're never done. I mean, this is a... You're never done. You're never done. It's all always evolving process because, you know, the people around you are changing, the circumstances around you are changing, you know, the competitive mm -hmm. forces are changing, the externalities are constantly changing, right? So you need to keep adjusting, readjusting yourself. But, but is there an underlying set of principles, uh, Vijay Abhishek, in terms of here are the three things that are non-negotiable? Because otherwise you're just con continuously reacting, it can be chaotic, right? So at least as my gate, have you said these are the three, four principles, like to Naveen's point, keeping life simple. So have you articulated what matters most uh, yeah. to you? What are those? Can you give us some examples? Sure, I can, uh, I can take, go, go first. So we just made a cute acronym. Uh, it's called ISEC, uh, Innovation, Speed, Excellence, Customer Centricity and Confidentiality, right? Yeah. Uh, so we just, uh, you know, talk about it whenever get, we get a chance, either in, uh, you know, new joiners or team lead or town halls. Uh, that's how we start, right? So I think the constant reinforcing of that. More importantly, how do you demonstrate that uh, in your work or your responsibility, how do you demonstrate that as a customer service person or a salesperson? So if we say that customer centricity is important, right? Then it means, for example, and, and if, uh, or let's say excellence is important, focus is important. Then we keep getting every year very strong inputs to say, you know, let's start 30 more cities, right? Yeah. But we have to just explain to them that it is not about 30 more cities. It is about doing what you're doing it right, dominating the cities that you're in before you start to just expand yourself. So excel and do a few things. So make that as a recurring example of how that value or your principle applies to day-to-day -day, uh, decision making when you are faced in that road, you know, crossroad of which path to take, right? Uh, so I think that's how we look at uh, some of these, and this acronym just helps reinforce excellence. Ka, you know, if you were to use the, just use the word excellent, it's a very cliched phrase. So we just right. translate it into a more you know, real thing which is chalta hai is not chalega, right? Uh -huh. Or if we say confidentiality is, then we say, you know, you will treat clients' information as if your life depends on it. 
Now that becomes the way of operating and doing things, right? Mm. If customer centricity, we translate into a line saying, you know, you will make your team members and clients your raving fans. Okay, so that is the behavior that I that is expected. So you've almost raised your principles to the level of like advertising statements to sort of give it a little bit of that that star power, uh, Abhishek. That and then convert into not just one phrase, but what is the expected behavior in one line? Hmm. Understood. Understood. Okay, let's uh, let's look at a few more factors and get a point of view from our audience as well. Uh, let's run our first poll on on the factors and what matters to people who are listening into us. You see that we've talked a lot about the first factor and all of you have shared how personal this has been for you. It'll be interesting to see how much our audience cares about that. Guys, I hope everyone is, is voting on the five options. If we have enough responses, can we look at the results? All right. Interesting. I see how HR systems work to your point, Naveen. Got zero votes. Uh, that's fascinating in itself. Uh, all of the above, though, got 50% uh, of the votes. Naveen, your, your reactions? Sorry, I'm just reading through this one second. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, I think the, so let, me, let me share something slightly, slightly different uh, because I read through this also a little bit. Uh, there are two, the, you know, when you think about, when you think about culture, let's think about, for example, you know, family, right? You can either have a great culture, and the family is a very small, you know, uh -huh. subunit of, of a company, but like you know, a family. Then you say, as a family, we have, you know, you have whatever values that you like, culture that you have, and if you have those pretty well decently done, you actually don't have to worry about how your kids will do. They'll actually do pretty decently well in whatever they want to do. And to me, that's somewhere the culture of a company also, you know, kind of comes in. So what I mean uh -huh. by this is. There are two kinds of entities that should get that get impacted uh, by by a culture, right? So there is people centric decisions, and then there yeah. are business centric decisions. And yeah. if you have to essentially, you know, take a hard call, you should basically be looking at saying, what am I doing in the? How is my culture impacting people? The decisions I make about people, the fairness, the question there was about fairness, yeah. uh, fairness about people. How am I as a head of the organization? you know, dealing with people, how am I, what am I allowing for people to deal with others? What I, what do I not allow for somebody to deal with? Um, how do I, how do I really treat them? Hmm. And then you can actually literally sit back. And by the way, a good culture is what happens behind your back, right? Not, in, not necessarily in front of you. And then you can sit back and be convinced that business results will come. Yeah, of course, you have to have the right OKRs and, you know, the right systems and alignment. That's secondary. But if you fix that first piece, then everything else will boil, uh, it will follow because you've, you've, you sorted that out. So for example, when we, when we did, uh, sorry, you so you're, making, you're making a big point there, Naveen. So I just want to make sure I've understood what you're saying, which is between making people centric decisions and business centric decisions. What you're saying is you have to have the conviction that you make the people centric decisions, business results will follow. Because is, what is, is that how you are? Yeah, is that what you're saying? Is business realities and strategies will change, huh. but some things will never change, huh. right? I could be doing well in this business, but because of some reason, you know, I have a you know different business or the business model is changing. All of those things will happen, huh. right? 
and and but what will not change is this this is this stays for generations if if not longer hmm. and so when you, when we think about culture one should think about saying it's basically how the decisions and how i make decisions about people how people make decisions about each other how they look at me so it's, it's it's all that component so for example you know one of the big principles we came up with is to say stop managing people right this whole thing about i am a manager i'm going to manage people who like just because you have <laughs> extra years just because you have three extra years of experience you're managing people like that's 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 wrong like there's something fundamentally flop you know there is mm. something is not right you have extra experience so you're not mm. managing so don't manage people but mm. grow your people now yeah. the minute you start to say you grow your people then you have to essentially make it real to say please yes. help grow your people uh, yes. and so the first thing we did by to make it real we threw out the performance management system in the company because that was the most bizarre thing that was ever mm. created by the hr you know experts out there in the world because it was breaking down what effort humans were putting towards into a piece of you know line items against which we would put some you know marks and score cards and whatever we would do and then compute an obscenely ridiculous number of like you know 2.3 out of 5 and therefore you are great or not mm-hmm. great it doesn't really understand the complexities of a lot of things around it now don't get me wrong that does not mean i don't care for results yes we do yeah. care for results but to essentially kind of run through that as a don't, process don't go into a check the box mode and reduce everything right. to yeah decimal yes, so point so when we threw out the performance management system we threw out you know bonuses for our people to say no no we are not going to pay you 100 like we going to pay you 100% bonus go take it because i trust you i fundamentally yeah. trust you the minute i said grow your people i fundamentally was starting to trust my people so i want to add something i want to add something navin to your point about managers which is again as part of our work across 20000 team members in the ecosystem we found that piece uh, and by the way manager not defined as just someone who has 3 years more experience to your point but someone who's adding with two conditions someone who's able to coach me effectively and grow me and someone who's able to add value to my work in terms of technical knowledge or otherwise just with these two definitions i want to share something with you guys and get and hear your reactions one is the companies that are at the top right the companies that are at the top have 80% of their managers score highly on these two dimensions which is quite astonishing right so 80% of their managers have a manager nps of greater than 40 at which point the company nps starts taking off and it's because they're good at these two things coaching their team members and adding value to their work the companies that are in the bottom quartile by the way 33% of managers have a manager nps of less than 0 less than 0 and the biggest reason for that is this person ain't adding any value to me so manager is not some god given right to manage just because you spend more time and if we haven't got this piece right because in a lot of startups that have gone from 100 to 1000 people suddenly you have a whole generation of people who are now managing teams who may not have these two ingredients perfectly sorted which is am i coaching and helping people grow and am i genuinely adding value to their work so in terms of making that practical and you guys have given a lot of examples of as founders how you've led the way how are your managers leading the way and how are you helping them become more effective at this any 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 tips or tricks on how to do that vijay you're muted vijay okay sorry so the day right you are able to take decision on behalf of your colleague right and the decision is right your colleague will tell and say that yes vijay has taken the right decision about me right uh-huh. i think that is the time people are actually finding value of each other right like say for example if abhishek asks me right that you know shreyans was uh, supposed to uh, get this done over the weekend uh, do you have any idea who are you kidding right mm. and if i say without even talking to shreyans right by knowing shreyans so well by interacting with him so uh, well and uh, you know helping him out or you know and all these things right by working along with him for you know last four years if i am able to take a decision and tell that hasar ho gaya right or ho gaya hoga right those kind of when you get those kind of answers from team members right 
and most of the times if they are right right that means you know you are finding whatever output of the right culture and value system that you are looking for is actually there in the organization right mm. so you know this is like you know in, uh, in the air force in the formation flying when you know four five aircrafts together go for a mission and after some point in time when they peel off and they're supposed to you know uh, uh, remaster again all of them do individual tasks and come back with complete radio silence and the confidence with which you know that each one of the team member or each one of the aircraft is doing their job and again it will come back to the rv point at the right time with the right results right mm -hmm. that is the confidence when you have in your team you know that you know everybody in the team is working or you know responding the way the organization is supposed to you know respond or the fabric which you are telling right everybody has mm -hmm. to be on the team fabric that is when you get the confidence yeah. got it Thanks, thanks, Vijay. We're going to go to a few questions. We have some amazing questions posted. Again, let's spend maybe the next uh, seven, eight minutes just uh, going through some of these, and I'm going to throw them out there. And uh, so the first one is: is how do you hire for the right culture, and how do you make trade-offs between culture fit and technical fit? And we'll go in rapid fire mode, literally one one statement. Naveen, you first. You know, it's very hard to make that decision. Because what happens is at the point of time when you have to make that decision, and it's not easy because yeah. the, these decisions are always, this is by the way, one of the most complex decisions to make. What the question was just the hiring about. decision. Yeah. Hiring decision, right? Who to get, who not to get. Um, and especially when you're getting somebody who is slightly, you know, more economical slash slightly better, you know, all of those, you know, factors come in and there is no great answer. Unfortunately, there is no great answer. I think the only thing that one needs to do is to be very rigorous about the practice that one is actually taking on the at the time of you know when you're making the hiring decisions now don't get me wrong which means by the way that you know there's somebody who really cares for your your culture and is testing for it and it's, it need not just be it need not be hr by the way like people who are recruiting care for that culture and they can talk about it openly look mm -hmm. about culture it is about being able to talk about it openly and not feel that you're a, you know it's like a you know flimsy topic it's a very important topic. That confidence has to be given out by the top management and they keep talking about culture in the meetings. That's one. Second, uh, I think the, uh, don't get me wrong, I think there will be roles, by the way, for which you will compromise on some of these things. It's not a, you know, 100 and zero kind of scenario. There are special ops roles. Like, you know, they're just those so specialized that you'll have to deal with some of these where the, there is a culture misfit and you have to acknowledge and say, okay, that's fine for these, but that should not be more than three to 5%. Like if it is more than three to 5%, then they're, you know, then they're coming back and spoiling it. And I think the third is when a, when a mistake has happened of this nature, you eradicate the mistake and you send a message out later on to say, look, we made a mistake. We couldn't judge like who can really judge for culture fit, frankly, also. Right. So one of the things that we did was to essentially reduce as much as possible hiring from the agencies, but get our own people to get us to hire. And we gave almost 50% of what we were paying to those agencies, which is like a goddamn a lot of money to oh. these, to our own people to say, get your people, get your friends, because now you're, you're putting your own reputation on. So, and one of the ways to perpetuate is once you have people who are already a good fit, the odds are that they're going to bring people who are an extension of that good fit. So that's it. And by so, the way, this very similar to this question is the previous question, which is about mid-management. The mm. mid-management question is like the reasons companies fail is because of mid-management. They don't fail because of many other things, but that's like, if you ask like CEOs to say, what was one of the biggest people sector, which screwed you up, it will be mid-management, mm. but you still have to go and fix it. Like, so if you go back and check for in movies, uh, mid-management feedback on, on Glassdoor, it's, it was bad about four years ago, three, four years mm. ago. So to go back and fix it by essentially ensuring that our leadership team, what we call a broad set of like 50 to 75 leaders are built from our mid management. So what happens is that if the pipeline of that is created, then the guy who has come in here from the mid management to this level knows what's going on wrong there. And he can go back and fix it because he at some, he or she at some point of time was in the mid management bucket. So you have, so one of the big principles we applied to try and solve for this and we're not yet sorted was to say, we will, we will uh, promote people for the newer, bigger roles mostly from inside and not from outside. So about 80% to 90% of our uh, roles in house are filled from people within the company so that the mid management gets, starts to get 
you know automatically to orient towards yeah understood um let me ask the next question uh, to you abhishek which is from harshit how many values should an organization have and what is the shelf life of values interesting question and does it stay consistent through the x to 10x journey so when we first started we did this brainstorming among a couple of us and we had listed out some 10 of them uh, we realized during the course of time that more than 3 or 4 is just hard to understand comprehend remember and apply it on a daily basis so if you just asking me a straight pointed question and putting it down on my head saying how many i would say between 3 and 5 uh <laughs> simple to understand but translate into expected behavior because just catch phrase and words like excellence integrity now they're all dime a dozen there are many of them but you know translate into your context and what it means for that individual and it should be understandable and translate into behavior and values on ground got it thanks uh, thanks abhishek we'll take one last uh, question there's so many good ones um all right um you mentioned oh there's a provocative one uh, navin you mentioned you changed the culture to no process vijay what's your view on that uh, and the process is at at my gate you are muted vijay so some of the processes right uh, or systems should help people right these are repeat tasks which are you know doesn't require a lot of your uh, thinking to perform right i think those all can be you know got under some process right mm. but you know customer centricity being innovative being helping your team members and all these things right you can't put process and systems around this right these are much more innate right any company that is even putting process these are just helping out the team members to do or deliver their job right especially you know uh, that doesn't require from them to exercise their brains but most of the things if you talk about the cultural elements these are more deep rooted right they need to think on those lines right mm -hmm. it is like even if you put a systems and process it will not help companies to you know develop cultures right i think having process to develop culture within the company or you know drive the cultures that you know the company want to set it up that will never going to happen right Yeah. it's only it has to be you know it has to be practiced demonstrated and you know on a day to day basis you need to you know get these things done right otherwise processes and call for culture i don't think any processes can help the culture so you're saying the culture is about the behavior that comes without process if anything process and system is about supporting and reinforcing as opposed to the process makes the culture happen exactly yes yes got it all right wonderful i think we are we're out of time there there are at least 25 other great questions we have to find a way to maybe we'll circulate it to you guys get your quick comments and and publish it out guys if you're if you're okay with that but uh we'll go uh, back to parth uh, for your concluding comments parth you're on mute again all right uh thanks navin uh, vijay abhishek and saiki uh, for this amazing discussion i think it was just great to hear all these insights and in, in stories from inmobi and mygate i think a few that that struck me the most were first when when navin said about how the small small things matter a lot towards culture building and how correlation between success and capital is slowly becoming weaker and correlation between human capital and success is becoming stronger and stronger and second what what abhishek said uh, uh, you know whether you like it or not culture will be formed so be aware of what's happening around you there are certain indicators about culture making or breaking look for them i think today's discussion certainly made it much more real for me and i'm sure for me for many people in our audience uh, big thanks again uh, and thanks everybody who joined look forward to seeing you all in the third episode uh, we will share the details very soon till then uh, stay safe have a great day goodbye thank you thanks everyone thanks navin abhishek uh, and okay. thank you so much